Good afternoon. This is the January 21st meeting of the Transportation Parking Commission. It is 4 o'clock. We will begin. I will announce the audio and video recording of this meeting. My name is Donald Scalia. I'm the Director of Public Works. I am the Chair. We'll start with introductions, beginning with the Vice Chair on my right. I'm Jody Casper, the Chief of Police. <laughs> Uh, Beth Kaplow, DPW. Devin Bruce, uh, Citizen Rep. Gary Hartwell, Citizen. Nancy Forrestal, Assistant City Collector and Parking Enforcement Administrator. Karen Foster, Ward 2 City Council. Jim Nash, uh, Ward 3 City Council. Okay, thank you. And we will begin the meeting with public comment. If there is any member of the public <laughs> would like to comment if you would not mind stating your name and address for the record. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, my name is Mark O'Neill. I'm not a resident of Northampton. I have worked here for quite a few years, and so I have reason to be here on a daily basis. Can you I, work at the quality, I work at the Quality Inn. Can you um, spell your name for me, please? Yeah, sure. M-E-R-C, O-N-E-I-L. My address is actually in where? It's 256 Malbouf, uh, I'll spell it, M-A-L-B-O-E-U-F. Road, and that's in uh, the rare, which is 01082. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. I spoke to Councilman Nash just a short while ago. Uh, speaking of technology, the phone dropped out, so that was interesting. Um, in my time driving through Northampton, and I briefly lived in Northampton when I could afford it, um, I've noticed that we've always had a bit, you know, a bit of a traffic versus pedestrian versus you know, issue. And I read, recently read in, the news, in one of the local papers that you guys had a big discussion about this recently. And I thought, you know, okay, who, who am I to really speak to this? But then I thought, you know what, why not? Because if I'm not, I might not be living here, but I'm certainly working here. And I'm certainly, uh, a, I hope to, to think of the community of the community. But um, I also, uh, Mr. N uh, Councilman Nash, you mentioned you guys have been concerned about specifically disabled people having access to the pedestrian access to the road, you know, cross the road safely. And, Whatnot, and I was pointing out to him just in brief that I find that a lot of intersections, a lot of crosswalks, are not very well laid out in the sense that there are oftentimes blind spots, dangerous blind spots, in fact. And uh, I know I can't go past three minutes, I get that I'm trying to be concise. For me, it's a very big challenge. But what one suggestion I would have is just for all crosswalks to have those automated light fixtures that you have in other cities where pedestrians are required to just push a button. We're not required a traffic light or anything expensive, just something that, you know, flashes saying someone's coming. Because even in this, even if people are driving the speed limit in this town, I've also noticed pedestrians just figure, okay, I walk into the crosswalk and suddenly impenetrable force barriers erect and I'll be safe. But that's not always the case. Right out in front of the street here, Town Hall, as they come around that corner, for instance, they might or might not see someone because of the parked cars, and then say, oh look, there's someone in the, you know, in a perfect universe, in a perfect world, the car driver would say, you know what, I'm going to drive slow. We also know that's not going to happen. But, uh, and by, unfortunately, the pedestrian versus car situation, the pedestrian loses. <laughs> and I'm, I saw that, you know, there was so many, I didn't realize there was quite so many accidents. I looked into it, there was a, there's a lot more accidents than I thought. And I just thought, you know, maybe this is the time for me to step up and say something, just to give my two cents. Now, that was over two minutes. That was about it. And, you know, I also had a video of very, uh, I, would, I was going to upload to Mr. Nash, but I couldn't get my technology to work either. And I'd be more than happy, once I get it figured out, to email a copy to him and then you guys can peruse it. Just uh, some of the more dangerous spots in town that I've noticed that I videotaped, you know, this is the situation as it is, and, you know, you might find it helpful, useful, or maybe like, yeah, we've seen this before, whatever. That. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to help us. <laughs> yep, thank you. Yeah. Because this is public comment, we are not allowed to have a back and forth. Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, just so you're aware of what's oh, yeah, around yeah. this body, but we thank you for your comments, and you are welcome to give us whatever information that that you have that that could be helpful. So please feel free to submit that to us. Okay. Okay, moving on the agenda. You get that working. Hey. I'm cracking at it. I'm getting in there. All right, so moving through the agenda, um, the next item is approval of the minutes from previous meetings, November 19th, 2019. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? 
from the meeting on November 19, 2019? I move approval. Second. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Okay, next, reports from departments and subcommittees. Does anyone have anything to report? Other than me, I have something to report from the Department of Public Works. Um, and I also have something to report just sort of generally about the commission. So as you may know, the commission has been restructured, restructured um, by the mayor's uh, changes. And um, there are, uh, there are some structural changes to the commission and that the director of public works is now the chair and the police chief is now the vice chair and now Nancy is a voting member um, and we have one advisor to the commission, Maggie Chan, she's a traffic engineer from the DPW, she is not with us today, um, but she is the advisory member. Um, so just kind of structurally, structurally, we look a little bit different now than we did a couple of months ago, and obviously we've got some counselor turnover as well. So welcome to our to our new member. Um, I also want to mention that as part of the restructuring, we will be making some changes to our traffic conning process, which I think will be of interest to a lot of people. Um, we have some traffic conning applications that have been pending for a very long time period. So what we are going to plan to do is start to kind of pick these traffic app calming applications off one by one, um, maybe like one or two per month. We'll do a little outreach to folks who have submitted an application to us in the past, let them know what the status is and how we're going to proceed. So we will be rolling this out as um, the meetings progress, and there is one of these on the agenda a little bit later on this evening. Um, and then from a DPW standpoint, so I will now sort of switch gears and say from a DPW standpoint, um, as far as a department, departmental update goes, I do want to announce that we are currently in the midst of preparing our paving for next year. Um, so the mayor has announced at City Council that we will be paving North Farms and North Maple, which is a significant stretch of roadway, so we are working very hard to get that up to bid now because it's a favorable bid climate to bid a, a large scale project like this over the winter. So that is our current focus. And those are my updates. Anybody have anything else? Yes, Councilor. Yes, so um, at the start of a new tradition of passing on the, the chair of the TPC, I am passing you the TPC train whistle that <laughs> so you feel free to use it whenever the topic of trains come up you can use it you can use it to um, you know uh, start or end a meeting um, it, it was actually donated to, uh, to the, um, the, um, the high-speed rail subcommittee years ago by uh, Jack Finn and I used it during those meetings and so I pass it on to you now, Director. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, wow. Councilor, for this generous gift. <laughs> Great, we appreciate that. Um, Director, uh, you both had some involvement in the Main Street project that came before. Wayne would normally speak to that, but he's not here today. I don't know if you want to. Uh, he, he formed the planning office formed a loose committee might be the you know there, there was a group that he particularly asked to attend those meetings um, i think i heard that a couple of times before the two days were out um, it's just but just for the record we heard, uh, the proposal from tool engineering for uh, a project no project scope but other than the beginning part of the street and the, the, the scope of how much is getting reworked, but none of the details of what they were going to do were really laid out in that first presentation. Thank you. Okay. Any other updates or announcements? Okay, moving on to matters before the commission. Um, First on our list is a proposed ordinance relative to parking on Bridge Street. Um, so 
think the easiest thing to do here, but you're going to be able to pull this up. Yeah, I'm thing. not, I don't think I'll be able to pull it up. I, who has laptops? I Are you able to get it on yours? Uh, yeah, I was just pulling up the, the things that were emailed. So um, I, I have three laptops. I figure, oh, I can just hand out laptops and people can pull it up that way. So um, I was going to offer to connect, but. Um, Oh, do you think you can connect? Maybe. I don't have the adapter with me, though. So oh. Not. So. Maybe not. Boom solver. Right, give me a second, okay. and then I'll have something for them to look at. You know, I was a roadie for Vicki Sue Robinson. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Running on stage and stuff. I'm, I'm I feel sorry. I'm having a flashback moment now. I'm sorry, I don't know who she is. Oh, well. <laughs> turn the beat around. Come on. Oh, I know that song. Yeah, turn the beat around. Wow. All right, central <laughs> office. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was going to Maybe she did. Maybe she did. Maybe that's my original song. Okay, I'm in. Is this going to come? Oh, this is going to come. One more second. Success. Try again. Yeah, I'm actually good with my version. Yeah. And so it's been changed from long term to. Okay. Yeah. There it goes. All right, so you guys can click on this. You'll see things coming in for my wife and my daughter. So. Yes. That's why I will be using myself in the home street All right, so. Okay, so this is item 5A, proposed ordinance relative to parking on Bridge Street. Um, so I will briefly describe what this is. Um, this was proposed uh, by the mayor, and this is the area next to historic Northampton. It is intended to create more long-term parking by installing red cap parking meters on these spaces, which are currently lined but not metered. It would also add one handicap space where there are none currently. So the ordinance has been drafted to reflect this general change. So do I have a motion to make a positive recommendation for these changes relative to parking on Bridge Street? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion to make a positive recommendation. So one other item um, that I have before opening this for discussion is there is, an, there is an email on this matter that came in to Councilor Nash, which I would like to read into the record. Um, this came from a resident, Howard Polonsky, P-O-L-O-N-S-K-Y. And he sent this email uh, to Councilman Nash, as I said, regarding Bridge Street. And his comments are, with additional meters, where is it proposed that all day workers will be parking? Since most people who work downtown can't afford to live here and public transit is limited, how will they get to their jobs? It seems like they are slowly being forced to park on side residential streets, which only increases the parking problems there, e.g. the Holly Street corridor and the first couple of streets off of it. City governance is like a Rubik's Cube. Feel free to use that trade comparison, Howard. Those are Howard's comments regarding this proposed change. I'll well, we'll open this to discussion. Anyone has any further comments? Yes, Councilor. So, um, so I, I distributed a sheet to everybody here. So both of the two, both of the parking zones that are up for discussion are in my ward. And so uh, I did a lot of outreach on these. Um, and that, um, so 
how do I summarize some of this? All right, so we're on the topic of Bridge Street, right? Um, so, um, so I, as far as Bridge Street, there was a lot of mixed enthusiasm, and it, I don't say mixed in like people I, have, I, I don't know one way or another. It was all very strong. There was there was a number of people, and you can see within the feedback there that people were like uh, people like at the Talbots. Uh, the Baker's Pen at uh, the Wells Fargo office, they were all strongly supportive of this moving forward. Um, there was also um, support for it from a, a number of the people who were parking in front of Retro Genie a few months back where we had to move that parking zone. By the way, Retro Genie's very happy with the change. They report everything. This is really, the, the, the way the city responded was really terrific. Um, there was, there's pushback um, on this from, uh, from uh, employees at the Roost who, um, who understand why we're doing this, but for them this has been free parking for them for, for a number of years. I've had reports that also uh, people from Jake's Park there as well. Um, in that zone I probably leafleted 50 cars on four different occasions. Um, I only got feedback from one person, and that's as they were that as they were getting out of the car. Um, I left my name and my phone number and my email address. And, and relative to both zones, from the uh, leafleting, I got no direct feedback, which kind of surprised me. Um, so uh, I and that in terms of the the the. Um, the people that pushed back or had the, the, the most concern were the people at Historic Northampton, who um, the, pretty much the, this, this new zone abuts their property. And that um, there I met with, I finally was able to meet with them today. And what they are looking for, for a few things. First of all, the, I received positive feedback about the, the handicap space at the front of the zone from just about everybody. And uh, Historic Northampton supported that. Um, but they were also wondering if there would be a way to split the zone. Because right now it's a zone of, I think it's uh, probably 14, 15 spaces. And they had the idea of could the first six spaces be short-term parking, similar to what's down by Retro Genie, and then the, the next eight or so spaces, once it starts to look like a residential zone, um, that those be eight long-term spaces. As you'll hear later, there was a similar recommendation from other businesses with that other zone. But um, that um, I'm just wondering if we as a group could consider that amendment to the proposal. Um, maybe it needs to go back to DPW to for further thought, um, and also, what kind of time frame do we have on this? Because if we're putting in meters, it, it's not it's probably not going to go in for another three, four months, correct? I think there'll be a lag. Yeah, it's right. So, so we might have a little time if we needed to research and discuss things further. So. Um, so anyway, that's that's my feedback on Bridge Street. Can I have a clarification on what red cap is? How many hours is that? It's long term, so it's going to be enforceable 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So somebody can park there all day yep. um, with a long term permit, um, or they can pay for all day. So they can pay up to the 10 hours. Okay. So you can leave your car in the same spot for 10 hours. Yes. And there's people parking there already. There are people parking there long term already. Yeah, because yeah. I saw there's concerns about like blocking views, but that's not. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. That's on Park Street. I'm sorry. Okay. So these are these are high use spots yeah. where people will park their vehicles and stay there all day long. Mm -hmm. um, they are often used by the same people who were parking across the street. Mm -hmm. Um, who were employees of the downtown area 
um, who are using long-term permits that they are paying for. And now, because those have become the two-hour spots, these folks are looking for parking. Um, so we, need, we should add more long-term spaces. We, have, we lost spots from the Union Station. That was a long-term lot. Those folks have now pushed further up towards the downtown area. A strong lot with its long-term parking is now becoming full early in the day, almost first thing in the morning, which now pushes those folks towards the Strong Avenue and the old 10-hour um, parking in front of the retro genie shops. So, you know, we've, we've taken away long-term parking. So my feeling would be that we now add long-term parking in spots that are already being used long-term, day in and day out, and no one is paying to park there. And when Wayne has been here before, he's talked about this, this development of business, new businesses and activity down here. So we know this will be an extension of Main Street, really. I think the city's right. hoping for that, to have more right. pedestrians. More, so we need to treat it the same way, probably. It, it has now um, it, it's gaining the same kind of pressures for parking mm -hmm. um, as the downtown um, business district because it's, as you were saying, expanding outward. And can I ask for a clarification? So you're saying that people who are parking there now are people who have long-term permits. And so they're parking, they've been pushed over in front of historic Northampton and they have the permits. And so by creating long-term parking, then people who are not paying for permits might move somewhere else and those people will have parking spaces available to well, them. Is we, we've, we've taken the long-term parking away from folks mm -hmm. who needed it in that area. Right. So of course it pushed them in front of the antique shops mm -hmm. through there and now that we've taken that away now where do they go mm -hmm. so my feeling is is that we have people parking there long term every single day anyways in these unpaid spots um, there's a there's a need for um, an extension of our long-term parking mm -hmm. there's folks who need it Wouldn't, wouldn't meters, whether they're long term or short term, wouldn't it promote turnover? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because just because it's a red top meter doesn't mean that that person is going to stay there for eight hours, for, for eight, eight or ten hours. hours. Yeah. Um, it's just an, an option instead of limiting folks to the two hours. Right. Question for Nancy. So, um, so you find that the the red tops are as effective at creating turnover as the blue tops? No, the, the blue tops, because they're limited to the two hours by nature, you're going to have greater turnover. Right. But we have employees of the downtown business district that we've taken long-term parking away from. So now what do we do for these folks? Yeah, I get it. So, the reason I'm asking is because part of the reason that historic Northampton was asking for the short term, you know, nearest their property or nearest the downtown, was because they, they worried that what would happen is with all of the permit parking, that, you know, the next eight, nine, ten spaces would all be taken up by permit. So what it would, is now height, higher turnover spaces would now become permanent park, you know, permanently parked all day. So the question is that if there are meters, does that is there some measure of turnover created by that, or um, the six? Let's back up to the six spots that were the long-term spots. You had six long-term parking spots. Three of them were probably taken up by the long-term permits. Okay. Okay. Um, so I don't think that even if we turn those all into long-term parking, that they will just be warehousing these long-term parking permits. I still think that a good percentage of those are going to allow for turnover. And if you go there today, take a look at the cars that are parked there. They're going to be there for hours. This is not a that, by nature of 
the type of area it is, because it's pushed up even more, you know, like another block, it's not going to be two hour parking for there. You're not going to have that high turnover. I think that we need to, long term parking, the red top meters were always on the outskirts of the downtown business district. And as that district grows, we need to grow with it and we need to expand that one. So, um, just to clarify, red top meter means if I have a permit, I can park there without putting money in the. Because you've already paid for it. Okay. Right. So, if somebody is fine with walking an extra block, they can park there all day because they have a permit. Yes. All right. I'm starting to get that. If they choose not to do that, anyone who's willing to feed the meter with quarters could park there for up to 10 hours. Right. But. I think the fact that there's a fee being charged by the hour will, just by nature of that, you know, force some turnover. And typically, I don't, I don't really know, but I don't think I would feed, is it what, 75 cents an hour? Right. It? it is, okay. So that's a lot of quarters to park all day. That's why it's a nice convenience of having the, um, the permit. You yeah. buy it for the whole sure. month up front. <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. I think I, I would say that I support this as it's written. I think that this is, you know, it allows folks flexibility, you know, and, and I think that um, its location is such that, um, you know, you probably have to make some short and long term, but it's good to give people the option of being there long term, so I would support this as it's written. I second that, but I am curious about data collection, just by virtue of you collecting money, you'll have an understanding of how the revenues change, right? So you'll know if there's some turnover. Oh, absolutely. Depending upon what you find in the meters, right? Absolutely. So when you collect money in meters, is it, is it each, I mean, I, I don't know how the process works. You have to open the thing and pull out the quarters. Is there a plan to go to a, um, a central meter, you know, a ticket dispenser? Oh, the kiosk? Yes, thank you. Well, we don't have enough right now. We've just ordered four more. Um, but people can also use Park Mobile, the app, to okay. pay for Park Mobile. I don't know how to do that either. But That's becoming so popular, pay by app. When revenue is collected from a meter, is each meter, is it, is it written down or is it recorded somehow that this is what the use is at this meter? Or is it just by street, or is it just collected and we don't know? It's, it's collected by its own. By his own. Right. Parking maintenance goes around and collects it. To me, it would be interesting to sort of keep an eye on that for the next year, mm -hmm. just Absolutely. to see what happens. I'm just curious. I, I support the sh smaller meters. Yeah. Yeah. The small number being short term, you know, higher, uh, the blue meters that turn over quicker to get that option to accommodate stretching the business on out into that area. And uh, I think we do need the long term, so I support it. The only question I had about it had to do with um, the bus stop that is in that area. Is the handicapped place an additional parking place that was that was not used before, or is, is that a new slot that will have a car in it? And the reason I'm asking is because uh, someone talked to me about the fact that in addition to bus stop, the school bus lets off right there at that same location. And so the sideline safety issues around people crossing the street across from the post office um, came up. So I just wonder, are we changing the sight lines in any way by putting, I mean, all of these spots are parking spots now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and our traffic engineer, Maggie, went out and measured it all out and, and deemed that that spot was going to be the most appropriate spot. Okay. Um, and it's the closest one to the, the bus stop. If I recall, mm -hmm. it does look like we're trimming a tiny bit of parking off the end. Like looking at it on the right, on the on the original one, you can see if you're looking at it, you can see that yellow line where there's currently no ordinance. So we can assume that people that's the 200 southwest of Pomeroy Terrace. We can assume that people are parking there. But in the new one, you can see that that red line where we'll, it will be prohibited at all times is actually going to we're going to lose a couple 
current areas. On um, that end, though, you're talking about the bus stop, which is further down. I think she's talking about the bus stop from Talbot. Talbot. I think she is too, but I'm just pointing out, as a matter of fact, we are actually losing some some spaces now that are probably being used by people just parking because it's there. Well, it looks like we're losing some footage of. Uh, right on the other just, side. Yeah, on the other side. But the other one, there's cars parking there now, and she just turned it into a handicap spot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and some of them, if, if I could, some of them, um, the spaces weren't actually measured out correctly. So <laughs> there's going to be a few changes there. Um, so Maggie identified that. I didn't even know. But um, she was looking at them, and, you know, she's trying to standardize all of these things. Um, appropriately, and found that you know there, there are some that need to be adjusted. Yeah, I'll also mention we did a very thorough analysis when we went through this bus stop, relocating this bus stop with PBTA, and we did a very thorough analysis of sight lines in and around this small shopping area to make sure that there were no sight line hazards around this driveway. I'm, I'm not familiar with whatever's going on with the school bus here, um, mm -hmm. but uh, but there's no sight line concern from DPW standpoint. Yes? In uh, Historic Northampton today mentioned the issue with the, the bus stop and I emailed the superintendent's office and so they're looking into that right now. I was questioning whether or not this was actually a good location for a, a school bus stop to have an old stop at that location where the you know signals come at the sign comes out that um, I mean it's a fine place for a PVTA bus stop people are exiting on the right hand side of the bus they're not ex crossing the street and um, they know to go to the corner to go to the crosswalk it sounds like kids are crossing right in the middle of the street and and that many drivers aren't understanding that so anyway I've emailed the superintendent and they're they're looking into that. The other thing is, I, in terms of losing parking spaces, these these spaces are already striped right now. Um, so, although they're striped incorrectly, what well, they're no, I'm not short, saying striped. I, I don't want. Well, to they're laid them. out right now. They're laid out, but there's a couple of them that are a little longer than the other ones. So right. Maggie wanted to get that a little bit more under control. Right, and that's that's something we will not be able to do until the weather is. Exactly appropriate for painting, so there will be a little bit of a lag on this, even with a positive recommendation of positive to vote. It's not something we'll be able to accomplish until the springtime. Is there any further discussion on this? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Councilor. Uh, so, um, you know, this is Ward 3, and so I'm going to hear it no matter what. And um, that um, I, I do want to make sure that, um, that we um, fully exhaust this idea of the the splitting the zone there is actually a natural point to split the zone in front of North historic Northampton there's there's going to be the um, if I'm counting the spaces the way they're drawn to uh, strike now there's going to be a handicap spot and then five spaces that will lead up to a very large uh, gap because of a fire hydrant and then the zone continues on, I believe it's another eight or nine spaces that go all the way up to uh, the end of the zone, which is up near the, um, the, 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 the new construction project that, that's going on. Um, and that I think that this would be a nice way to um, kind of split the difference, which is what counselors are always looking to do. <laughs> And, uh, but I, you know, I will defer to DPW on this in terms, in, in parking, in terms of that, you know, it's, it's your call on whether or not that could fit in with the way we do things. Um, that I, I don't want to be asking us to do something that's uh, out of the ordinary and uh, doesn't, doesn't fit in with our policies. So. I think from the you know from the DPW standpoint, we make sure we have appropriate space. We can put signage in. So you know, as far as the DPW is concerned, um, we do not have commentary around um, parking zones, um, as you're describing. I think this would be more of a what does the parking mean? You know, what what is the demonstrated need, and, and how should we best fill it? Um, 
you know, great. I will also add that typically when we make decisions around our roadways, we do what's in the best interest of the city and the greater population. Um, and that's something that we're very mindful of. Um, so that's my comments from the Philly standpoint. I will defer to, to Nancy if she has additional comments on, on what the need is here for more limited parking, if, if you have any comments. I just think that it would be um, appropriate to, to make them 10 hours so that we do provide the option of short-term parking as well as long-term parking. And I support that flexibility. Is there any further discussion? So are, are we saying that it's okay to split the zone and, and do we want to make that a, that amendment and then send it forward to council? Well, the, the motion that we have is to accept it as it is. to set the positive recommendation as it's currently written, and it is currently written as um, right top, mm -hmm. which is long term parking. That's how it's currently written. Mm -hmm. um, so, what we could do is we could vote on that and if there is if it doesn't pass mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we could revisit it or if you feel strongly that um, an amendment needs to be made to this we could make one um, although I don't know that we have consensus with the commission that this is something that's necessary so I think there's there's one business that would like limited time parking here, but that, mm -hmm. that I'm not sure that the commission finds that that's um, warranted. Well, maybe I didn't understand that. I thought you were saying that the mix of blue and red was... No, thank you for letting me clarify. I, I believe that this should remain as written, that it be all long-term parking, which allows people to remain in place long term or short term, depending upon how long they want to stay there. But it gives folks that option to stay long term. It doesn't limit them to two hours only. So I like the long term. Because it allows you that one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five hour. It gives people that option. It also allows folks who are using these long-term permits so that they can pay to park long-term, park them. So the recommendation for parking then is long-term parking for flexibility. Correct. And I, I support that flexibility. I think generally the more flexibility you give yourself in operations, the better it is for the, a larger group of people. Um, however, I certainly understand the um, implications to local businesses. In this case, there is no DPW. You know, the DPW has no consideration. Um, the, the parking space is the parking space. The size is the size, you know, whether it's long term or short term. Um, so I would defer to the person who is in charge of parking in this particular case. Um, so, is there any further conversation around this? Yes, Councilor. So, um, yeah, so as, I, you know, I'm kind of the person who also put myself in this hot water to start out with because, you know, that it was the discussion of all of these different parking spaces. I went to the mayor's office and we talked about it in council that we need more long-term parking. And this is, is an obvious spot for additional long-term parking. And um, so, um, yes, I, I'm, I'm going to support this going forward based on the recommendation from parking and DPWR on how to handle this. And, um, and I'm, you know, if things really don't work out well, we can, I guess, come back and revisit things at some point as well. So, um, that's my comment. Is there any further discussion? I'll just make one more comment. 
I think by virtue of having a parking meter that you feed quarters into that allows you 20 chunks of time at a time by that nature, whether it's long term or not, allows for turnover. And I, I support that. And I, it's hard, I, I can imagine being a business and either wanting the parking to remain free under the assumption that it will be more available. Um, I think anything that, that forces turnover is, is a step in the right direction. And the whole point of this was long term parking. And what you've got here makes perfect sense to me. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so we have a motion to make a positive recommendation as written related to changing parking schedule on Bridge Street. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, it passes. Okay, next. Item 5B, proposed ordinance relative to parking on Pleasant Street. Um, so I will just give a brief summary of what this is, uh, sort of similar situation to what we just discussed. Uh, the area covered goes from Northampton Bicycle to the Medical Building and is intended to create more long-term parking by installing red cap parking meters on about 10 spaces that are currently not metered. Um, this would also allow city parking permit holders to park there as we just discussed. Um, so there are two emails that I want to um, just read into the record that also went to Councilor Nash. Um, but first, let's um, let me, uh, does anyone want to make a motion to make a positive recommendation for changes relative to parking on Pleasant Street? All right. Second. Okay. Um, so now I will read these emails into the record. Um, so this is regarding parking on Pleasant Street. And this email was sent to Councillor Nash. This is from Marlene Morin, M-O-R-I-N, and she owns the property at 297-299 Pleasant Street. Dear Councilor Nash, the spots located in front of 297 to 299 Pleasant Street would best serve the public if they were two hour max. I noticed that since the coffee shop opened, more people are parking on my property without permission. The coffee shop is a great business for the area and two hour parking would best serve their need and help solve the unauthorized parking problem that I experienced. Thank you for your attention to this problem, more Marlene Warren. Um, the second email came from Robert Osberg, and again, this came to Councillor Nash regarding parking on Pleasant Street. Jim, thank you for the opportunity to voice our concerns regarding the on-street parking in front of our building. We have seen a large increase in the use of our parking lot that is free to clients, customers, and residents of our building. Since Netta opened its doors, we have had to increase our building and parking security, but parkers continue to use the lot despite clear signage. We welcome the free on-street parking, but our collective concern is for the safety of all as they exit our parking lot due to the last two parking spaces that extend to the north on the west side of Pleasant Street from our south exit. The last space is a particular safety hazard. We voiced our concerns before the final payment, pavement, and line drawing, and we're disappointed to see the space repainted. It is impossible to see oncoming traffic traveling south when the space is occupied. Delivery trucks increase the traffic through the parking lot in order to access the exit near the bike shop to avoid this exit. Others seek alternative routes via the wellness center lot. This is not a safe option and violates their private property. Daily there are near misses and the troubles increase in warm light when the foot traffic is heavy. We respectfully request that the last two parking spaces to the north of our south exit be eliminated in order to improve the safety of the exit. And that is signed by Robert K. Osberg of Osberg and Associates, 351 Pleasant Street. Okay, is there any discussion about this? Go ahead. Before there's discussion, I just want to name that I'm the executive director of All Out Adventures, and our business uh, is newly at 297 Pleasant Street, and um, I am not going to participate in discussion because I cannot take off my All Out Adventures hat to be here, so I'll be silent later. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any discussion? This needs to be done. It's, it's really bad. Uh, the, Neta facilities certainly contributed to it, but in general, there's just a lot of people looking for free parking in our downtown area as things are getting busier. And I've pulled out of this parking lot before, and it, it's tricky when you turn your head to the left, you really, you have uh, obscured vision. Uh, and we've had accidents in this area. Luckily, you know, so far, nothing 
crazy series, but that's exactly what it is. It's cars that are pulling out of driveways um, or some of these streets. And most folks, they're, they're not from the area, if they're visiting Netta, or they're not really familiar with where everything is. So uh, we've had cars pull out in front of traffic. So I would I fully support this. I think it'll be, I, I like seeing that the parking uh, will be pushed back from that southerly uh, entrance and we'll have some meter parking, which I think will be great. Okay. Any other discussion? Counselor. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, yes, I'm not sure that what's on the on our map here represents the space, a space being eliminated. Uh, that um, I, I think what it represents is there's like a triangle that goes out and then the space. The, the spaces are line strike. Um, and so, um, and I think what uh, Mr. Osberg is referring to is when cars are parked, in, in, especially in that first space, that, um, that the, the, uh, the, the, for the oncoming traffic, they have poor vision, and for the people trying to get out in traffic, they, they have to stick the nose of their car out before, you know, it, it, and they can't see the oncoming car. Um, so that, um, that, and I heard from every business that's associated with this parking lot, whether it's Northampton Bicycle, uh, the lawyer's office, the UPS store, um, I, all of the folks said that they have difficulty, especially, you know, because of those spaces at the southerly end of the zone. And that my, I, I, my request is that, you know, it be examined whether or not we need that last one or two spaces there, especially the last space. Um, Can I interrupt? I'm sorry. There's no spaces there, right? Nancy, are there spaces there now? Yes. There's six spaces. And they're aligned? Unpaid six. Oh, unpaid spots. two. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Jim. I need that clarification. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, that, um, yeah, so other, other than that, the, the businesses in this area were all supportive of the idea of long-term park, metered parking being there. That, um, so. Can I talk about, on the diagram, aren't, aren't we in the middle of that one that you were talking about where Millbank Place comes out at the bottom there? Mm -hmm. And there is the red no parking. Is that not what that's Oscar the, is requesting? That's what he's requesting. I think what it is, is you can see in the first picture, the word Millbank, like where the end of the K is, that's yellow, right? The yellow line goes down there. And I think yeah. people are, perhaps you, using that space, although Nancy, you know better than I, they're like oh, parking sure. too close. So what the gentleman's asking for, I think it's exactly that, that yes. red line that would be prohibited right. to so push just, them back. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think, think we're doing exactly what he's asking. I think so too, yep. Um, yes. I wish I had my overheads. I don't think we are because I think that, that there's actually, there's a, I, it's line strip, what, it's a 20 foot setback from I think we actually have a 20 foot setback from that curb cut before we start the spaces. And, um, and that still is, is a really difficult um, area to pull out from. So, um, Jim, there's a little bubble on this gun right here that says 27 feet northwest of Mill Bank Place. Okay. Do you right. same gun? Yeah, I'm looking at it here. All right, thank it says you. 27 feet. I am curious about the northerly curb cut right by Northampton Bicycle. There is a curb cut, which is right about the middle of uh, the zone we're talking about here. Um, and it's kind of tight, it's right against the corner of the building. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of blind. If you're on a bicycle, it looks fine. But it is tight. People do pull in and pull out of that curb cut. And you're talking about by Northampton It's uh, between the S in the street and the R in Route 5. It's right there. Well, I can add that right there in front of North, uh, in front of Northampton Bicycle, there were, I believe there were two spaces there, and we eliminated those at some point. Okay, well. So there's, looks like this is there's actually very good uh, sight lines if you're pulling out from that location. But this is the proposed ordinance would put parking back in there, including in front of the curb cut. And so this, I mean, if we want to honor the 20 foot on either side of the curb cut, then you need to. 
Right, but if those are if those are marked spaces, those are delineated spaces. Yeah. So I don't know if they are. They're, so they're striped right now. They were. Are those striped, Nancy? Yeah. I have a street view, but it's, it's, probably, not it's, it's probably not. It's probably not been well, up well, it hasn't been changed. This is like a year old. But I'm not sure. I'm pulling in against the building, and that curb cut. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, that's like the major entry point for that parking lot. I think most it, people, it if they're is, traveling it, south, they enter yeah. there and exit in the yeah. south. You can see the green paint that is uh, the cycle track, whatever it's called. I don't know if you can see it from over there, but that's the building and the image. Um, I think what we're questioning is the yeah. the diagram says that it's on street parking meter zone right, right, right through, through mm -hmm. that curb cut. Yeah. Well, I mean, the ordinance says right now you can't park within three feet of it. So okay. we know that we're going to be at least three feet away on either side <laughs> by ordinance. Should it be further back, I would have right. to and, defer. And to what we idea. will do is we will have to delineate this when we actually Absolutely. stripe it. So okay. we will, you know, because once we create a meter zone, like we have to tell you this is the place where you're parking. We can't just let you park them, you know, pull off on the shoulder. Like, well, the nice thing about it is that is currently mostly inbound traffic into that parking lot, mm -hmm. and so the sight lines are not the problem there as much as coming out. So I, I like it. Yeah. Yes, So, um, back to my list. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, in front of, what was it, uh, Miss Morin's request, um, if you look, so this would be at the most northerly end of the zone and in front of the, the building, which is right here, there are currently two striped parking spaces. And her request is that they be the same as the zone, which is directly on the other side of the intersection here. So throughout, if you go down Pleasant Street in, in front of Northampton Coffee, and by the watering hole, these are all two-hour parking. And that this is a business, Ms. Morin, Ms. Morin's running a business here, we have the optical studio over here, that, um, that both the watering hole and Ms. Morin requested that these spaces be, uh, be two-hour short-term parking. Um, and this be considered part of that zone rather than and, and that this long-term zone be considered separate. I know it's a familiar theme. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? <laughs> so I, I guess what I would say to that is currently there is no ordinance. Um, so, you know, people would be parking there all day, now they have to pay. This is very similar to historic Northampton, so it sort of gets into the customizing, um, you know, customizing streets, if you will, or customizing parking zones. Um, you know, and again, like uh, Bridge, Bridge Street, the DPW delineates a parking space, but, you know, we're, we're looking at the parking space and the signage. Um, more than we're looking at the need necessarily. Um, so I would, again, defer to parking for comment on this. Well, um, the, our view on this is that, like the area on Bridge Street, um, we have displaced long-term parking from where it was, um, and we are trying to provide more long-term parking um, for folks, and as we're, I did have that area monitored a bit at, to see how long were people parking there in these spaces. And folks are staying there for long term anyways. Um, it's not a, a high turnover parking area to begin with because you don't have to pay park there. There's no limitation on how long you park there for. So by metering them, um, we are going to create a, a better turnover pattern, but by making them long term, we are providing that option um, to employees of the area. Um, 
who may be working in that downtown area or that downtown business district. And once again, our downtown business district is moving down Pleasant Street. Uh, so I, I think that this is that outer edge of it and that that is an appropriate place for long-term parking. Any other discussion? Yes. Well, I was just curious about meters. How difficult would it be to change from long-term to short-term meter? It's not difficult. If, um, parking maintenance switches out okay. the head on it. That's what I thought. Thank you. So I could try it out from there. One yes. last thing. So um, it was mentioned by one of the business owners, and I thought it was a very good observation, to ask the question, do we need a handicap space anywhere in this area? The nearest one is going to be another uh, half block or more north of this zone, and it's up by uh, Roberto's. We added that, and um, you know, do we in, that um, diagonally? If you go up to the northern part of the the map here, on the the right hand side, that's where the lumber yard is, and that some people with disabilities live there, and that. Um, but also that within the entire zone, I'm sure people with disabilities want to go to beerology as well sometimes, and you know, or maybe you know the watering hole. So um, having a, a space in that area might be appropriate. Are there not, wouldn't there be uh, accessible parking that would have gone in with the Lumberyard project? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, but the, that is there. for the, the tenants only. Right. And it, so it's not for any visitors okay. or, um, right. What about the parking lots to the south of um, the UPS store? I don't know what the name of those lots are. The simply lots there. I, I, I know they're privately known, they're not city lots. I'm just wondering if they have any accessible parking. I just don't know what, what's in those lots. Yeah, it's like the State Board of Health. In that building? Uh, right, the State Board of Health. I don't really even know what's in the building. There's one that's right out on the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just beyond the parking lot in front of um, the UPS store. And there's a big lot to the south of that. And is any, are, the, are those spaces restricted? It's not public parking. What about in the UPS store lot? You know, that they'll use I mean, that's a parking lot for those businesses. Right. Do they have an accessible space in, the, in that lot? Do you know? I don't know. There's at least one. Is there? Yeah. yeah. Right in front of the UPS. Yeah, I was thinking that. Given that I would think they would have to buy color. I don't think so, too. That's really what the question is. I think that, it, I mean, it's a good question. We would it, we would need to look at the area. We would need to see what we have for curb cuts. We would certainly need to solicit input um, mm -hmm. directly from the Disability Commission. Um, you know, I think we have an immediate sort of pressing need here right now. Um, and what I I think just kind of for safety and operational reasons, um, we should move this in a positive way and we can certainly revisit the question of the handicap space and look at, you know, installing one if it's warranted um, at a later date. But, um, you know, I think this... At this point, this has my support as it's written, and we can certainly read it the if necessary. Any other discussion? Yeah. So I would appreciate DPW, you know, thinking about, you know, you know, that question of do we need something in this area around a handicapped space, and I'd be interested in. Um, I'll be voting again. I brought this stuff Can upon me. <laughs> so I'll be setting this forward with a positive recommendation. I'll be yes. voting. Well, not to correct Jim's request, but it seems like to me what we really want to know is what is the usage of the nearest handicapped parking place, which would be Nancy's, to let us know about. So if, if that space is often open, 
worn up by protesters, then that would be an indication that there's not pressure needed for one more or further out of town. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, at the time that we, at the time that we deliberated on the matter of the handicap space by Roberto's, there was a need for that space, um, and I'm certainly open to reviewing this area to see if it's even possible, first of all, based on the topography here, um, and then if, if it is possible, we would confer with Nancy, like, is there actually a need? So that's something that we can just um, sort of have on our radar. It's no problem. Okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, so we have a motion for a positive recommendation regarding changes to the parking schedule on Pleasant Street as written. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstentions? Karen abstains. And it passes. Okay, next. 5C, discussion of traffic and pedestrian safety at the intersection of New South Street, Main Street, Elm Street, West Street, and State Street. Um, this is on the agenda because, at my request actually, because we have received, um, both at the DPW and at police, um, and also uh, in the mayor's office, we have received many comments from many folks about pedestrian safety at this intersection, um, primarily because Cars are turning right from Elm Street onto New South Street, and there are pedestrians in the crosswalk concurrently with the cars turning. Um, and this is a source of fairly constant conflict throughout the day um, because it is a concurrent pedestrian phase. Um, so I just wanted to, I guess, provide an update on this in a public setting. Um, and a, I have told the mayor's office to please respond to folks when they come in with a request um, with the following update, and this sort of goes into the Main Street conversation. So Main Street is currently being looked at, this entire corridor is being looked at by Tool Design. Um, this project is on the tip for, I think it's 2025, so the entire Main Street corridor, including this intersection, is to be Designed. And it's important that we're mindful of this when we're talking about discussion of, of safety in this intersection because there will be wholesale changes made to the entire Main Street corridor, including and especially this intersection as part of this project. And so what we need to think about is what can we do now, you know, because 2025 is obviously five years from now. Um, so one of the things that DPW did, and again, I just wanted to have this, this conversation sort of for the record in a, in a public forum, um, we have, in most major cities, there are concurrent pedestrian phases. So there's a concurrent pedestrian phase and there is an exclusive pedestrian phase. An exclusive pedestrian phase means all traffic stops and the pedestrian crosses the street. Concurrent phase means the cars move as well as the pedestrians moving, like, sort of concurrently and everyone needs to avoid each other. Um, and obviously, you know, that's how accidents happen. Concurrent pedestrian phases are used when um, long traffic delays would occur if there was an exclusive phase. So if we had an all stop at this intersection, the traffic backups would not be tolerable for most people. Um, so we have to be mindful of creating a traffic scenario that's going to, um, you know, delay people, cause inconvenience, maybe stop people from being downtown. Um, but we also need to be mindful of how can we how can we protect pedestrians, you know, sort of in the middle of this. So one of the things that we did was we put in what's called an LPI. It's called the Leading Pedestrian Interval, and what this allows is people crossing New South Street a three-second head start while traffic is held in turning right onto New South Street. So that traffic is held for three seconds to give the pedestrian a chance to get into the, into, into the crosswalk so that the driver has better visibility of that pedestrian in the crosswalk. So we installed that three second LPI. We did it, I want to say last summer, and actually got really good feedback on it. People felt like there was more visibility, they felt like there was less near misses, um, and I think it's been working very well, but what folks need to understand is we can't just make wholesale changes to our traffic controls without significant engineering studies which take time and cost money. And where 
where Main Street and this intersection are already under review and are already being studied and there will be changes associated with this intersection, it would be redundant to start a concurrent study where we are then sort of, you know, trying to do something with this intersection like as a stopgap measure. Um, so one of the things that I have been pondering is <coughs> increasing the length of that LPI to say six or seven seconds to give many pedestrians the opportunity to be mostly across the street or very much in the middle of that crosswalk before cars actually start turning. And the question is, can, will that LPI create significant backups? And the answer is, is that that's really unknown until we try it. So one of the things that I am looking at is, is this a possibility and we might want to trial it and see what we get for traffic congestion at this intersection and sort of how bad it gets and if it actually has a benefit to the pedestrians. So I don't know if anyone has any comments on that. I just wanted to take the opportunity to say this in a, in a public setting because we have had a lot of conversation around this via email and phone calls and a lot of outreach that's done to the DPW and police. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are not inactive on this. We are actually active on this, but improvements are going to take time. Any other discussion around this? Could, yes. Could you just repeat one more time exactly which crosswalk intersection we're talking about? You said New South Street. Yes, yes. so the, the, it's the crosswalk at New South where you turn right from Elm Street. From the Sullivan building across to the... <coughs> so if yeah. I'm a pedestrian, I have to cross a short section in, onto an island. Correct. And then wait there and then cross again. Correct. Okay, yep, I know the intersection, sure. Thank you. Any other discussion about this? Yes. The smallest comment, honest. Um, I think part of the problem is there's a rolling stop turn for everyone coming through that intersection. You know, whether it, it, we're, we're almost ignoring the signal, um, which is, you know, that I think that's what I've seen more than not. It, I like the, I like what you've done, and. If you feel like you might want to trial it longer, that's great. Um, you know, you'll be able to see if it flat, backs up into West Street and it stops up that intersection. It's very short. But I just, my experience is it's car misbehavior as much as it is anything else. Yes, it's definitely folks, you know, yeah, turning that's right it. on red without stopping. And right, that's, a, that's a big piece of this. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate the, the tweaking that DPW is trying to do at this intersection. Um, it's It's got to be the most complicated intersection in Western Mass, except for that thing in East Longmeadow, which, which is multiple roundabouts or something. But this it's a terrible intersection. It's very difficult for everybody, and um, really appreciate the work you guys are doing. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? I would support another trial as well, especially it sounds like it doesn't take a lot of resources. Um, the three seconds have made a difference. I would definitely be in support of trying a little bit longer. That that intersection is my way into town, and I, and I know the backups and the sense of what happens um, with that, and yet um, I think orienting toward the safety of bikes and pedestrians, um, you know, if, if we're trying to decide um, a shorter back, you know, a back of the cars or the safety of, of cyclists and pedestrians and wheelchair users that would be a support of trialing um, something that, that would increase safety. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other discussion? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, what I would like to do, 5E is a discussion of intersection of Pine Street and Maple Street. If there are no objections, I would like to just move this up before Councillor Nash's War 3 up. Truck update, does anybody have any objections to that? Okay, good. Then I'm going to take 5E out of order, discussion of intersection of Pine Street and Maple Street. Um, this is a, uh, an update, as I stated at the beginning of the meeting, we are taking these traffic calming requests that have been backlogged for a long time, and what we want to do is provide updates on where we are in the process of this. We want to communicate with the citizens who actually made the request and then discuss how we are going to move forward. So what I have is an update on this request. Um, so what I will 
start by doing is just saying what the original request was. So this came to us on June 25, 2017 from a gentleman named Robert Thomas Sippel, who lives at 121 Pine Street. And I did speak with Tom Sippel earlier in the week and had a conversation with him about this. Um, he told us that there were problems at the intersection of Pine and Maple with pedestrian and bicyclist safety, high volume of traffic and trucks, sight line issues, speeding issues, um, and that it was difficult to cross the street. Um, and then several folks within that neighborhood um, you know, signed the petition as they are instructed to do in the traffic calming manual. Um, so what DPW has done with this is we have um, commissioned a study by an engineering firm named Fuss and O'Neill and they are looking at this intersection, they are looking at sight lines, they have taken traffic counts, they have taken turning movements, meaning who's turning where and when are they turning, are they going left, are they going right, are they dragging a trailer behind them, um, you know, what time of day it is, is it worse at, at, at night or in the morning. Um, so they have compiled all this da data and they have been working on this as part of a study of several intersections that we will actually discuss here at this commission um, in later months as we move through this um, backlog of, of traffic calming applications. So my update around this intersection is twofold. Um, this study is actually nearing completion and what I expect back once it's done is some ideas on how to improve the intersection. So do we put up a stop sign? Do we put in a roundabout? Do we put up a flashing light? Do we um, you know, make other geometry changes which will help people to maneuver through this intersection um, in a safer manner? So I expect some alternatives to current conditions in this intersection as a result of this study. So I'm expecting something back um, really any day now, um, and once that report comes back, it will be shared with this commission, it will be shared with the residents, uh, they will be invited here and given an opportunity to speak to what their experience is, and we will, um, we will engage them as we move forward. Um, the second thing that I will mention is there is a fence at that intersection that was actually put up within the city layout, um, and we are working with the building department to rectify that situation. Um, so that's just kind of an aside, but the, the larger update that I have shared with the original applicant is that this study is pending and a, a release of something there is, is to be expected. Does anyone have any comments on this? Yes, Councillor. As the, the, the prior chair and hearing all of the concern voiced over the last two years, I think this is really cool. And um, thank you for... I, you know, Fuss and O'Neill, I, I really look forward to what they have to say. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so now we will go to our last agenda item, which is 5D, War 3 Truck Update by Councillor Nash. Okay, all right, well, so I'm going to work to keep this as brief as possible because my brain is so in the weeds on all of this. So, um, so what got this going was um, late last June, before the planning board uh, was a uh, co came before the planning board asking to put in a laydown lot on their property for 11 to 12 trailers, and they needed uh, for site plan and they needed planning board approval. And um, were two of the planning board members, George uh, Kohat and Krista Granat, are former DPC members, and they said, "Hey, wait a minute, let's talk about those trucks." And um, and uh, so the uh, so Coke uh, had their their feet held to the fire a bit by the planning board, and it gave me an opportunity to uh, get some constituent um, interest in the matter. Um, and also, about the same time, we had a number of trucks hitting the bridge. And as I was standing out there with uh, a reporter from the Gazette, we realized that this driver was on his way from Coca-Cola, and a light bulb went off in my head of like, well, hold it, we, if we have data connecting Coca-Cola with that bridge, <laughs> then that would be of interest to the planning board, and also it would be of interest to the entire city that one of the issues that Ward 3 has with its truck problem is that 
All of the, most of the truck problem remains in Ward 3 because we have four bridges to keep the trucks in Ward 3. So, um, so what I did is I started, thanks to uh, uh, Chief Casper and our police department, they sent me oh, probably five, six years of reports on bridge strikes. And I started, and, and, but I went through all of the reports and it wasn't clear what the trucks were doing here. Where were, what were you doing here? Where were you going? How did you end up at the bridge? And so I uh, started in a very friendly way talking to all of these mis Midwestern folks and reminded them that I'm from St. Louis myself and it's nice to hear from you. And, and so they, and I was able to, you know, gather this information about by and large what, what the trucks were doing here, what they, you know, and, um, and so if you go to, I think it's the fourth page here, um, so, uh, bullet number three, six of the nine tractor trailer bridge strikes involve carriers that were in Northampton servicing Coca-Cola. So, not only did I let Coca-Cola know about this, but I also let MassDOT know about it when Coca-Cola Coca -Cola and I were meeting with them about signage. Um, eight of the 11 strikes were vehicles heading westbound on Bridge Street, which shouldn't, shouldn't surprise anybody because that's the Ward 3 side of the bridge. The downtown side, you got, um, uh, what was it, uh, three of the strikes were coming from downtown. Um, most importantly, of the nine tractor-trailer drivers involved in bridge strikes, all were long-haul truckers with addresses outside of New England. Delaware, Georgia, Iowa, Idaho, Indiana, North Carolina, Texas, Florida, Alabama, and Tennessee. And if you go driving in any, any of those places, you will never see anything like our bridges or like what goes on in, in Ward 3 or any New England town. That, you know, that you go out in the, those areas, everything's wide open and it's clover leaves and it's easy to drive a truck. And these people are coming here. Um, and uh, so let's go down to the themes because it gets to uh, the first one. The carriers involved in tractor trailer bridge strikes tend to be trucking brokers where fleets can be a layering of company owned and operated vehicles leased equipment with company drivers or private subcontractors with their own equipment this is basically saying that when you're talking to a carrier the person who hit the bridge may not have hit it with their tr with the carrier's truck it might have been the driver's truck or it might have been the driver's cab in the carrier's trailer that it's almost it's almost like there's uber for trucks going on out there and that's why you got these guys from all over the place and they dropped something somewhere and they're calling in and that that their their carriers are saying well swing over to coke and you can pick up something else and that'll bring you back towards home and so you have all of these inexperienced drivers that are being brought here by this kind of uber type of organization um, possible remedies, the last page. So the first six bullets were really, the, I, this report was designed for planning board, but I intended it to bring it to TPC at one point, um, which is today. But the first six were for planning board, because it's all very, hopefully I was hoping planning board would be able to impose some things on Coke. And the best part, we, actually it was the best outcome, because Coke came and in many ways addressed all six of these voluntarily. And they'll be coming back to planning board um, and with, the, with a report in August to talk about any progress. And in the meantime, I'm in fairly regular contract with Brian Duran, who's the plant manager. And um, he's, he's, he's been very helpful and he, he wants to help solve the problem. He's met with the Ward 3 Association and met with some angry neighbors. And in fact, the night that it was before planning board, it was, it was, that was the night Dewey Court came, was here. And that went till like 11 o'clock at night. Meanwhile, outside over there is Coca-Cola and the Ward 3 neighbors, and they're working out the whole thing. So by the time they're rolling in at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, they're all buddies. They they liked everything. They're like whatever Brian wants. He's he's okay. So it it was a very positive outcome. Um, the last three bullets here are what I'd like to talk about with the TPC. 
um, because they're more focused on things we can do. Uh, explore enhanced directional signage with MassDOT that factors in road fatigue. So uh, Brian and I are actually working on that. Part of what's happening is that it's really northbound trucks heading to, Co to Cope. They're getting off at exit 19 and they're hitting the ramp and that's where we're hitting them with information. That that's the first thing. Also, they're probably looking at their GPS and their GPS may be telling them to turn left. And so we got a flashing light saying, don't go this way. And you're like, what the heck is that? Don't go that way. There's a bridge or something. And then, you know, Northampton Industrial Park, there's a sign pointing. So, well, I think I saw that. Now I'm sitting at the light, but my GPS told me to turn left, so I'm sitting in the left-hand lane. And then I look way across, and there's a little sign for Coca-Cola. And it's like, how am I going to get in the right lane here to go straight? I'm kind of committed. And so there they are heading down Bridge Street and heading into what I call the, the War Three truck trail and um, that so what the new roundabout should help with this because there's rather than being allowed to get in the left hand lane everything's going to be in two lanes that are going to get you going right into the roundabout there's going to be a sign at that egg you know at that point at the end of the ramp as you enter the roundabout saying Northampton Industrial Park is on the other side as you're going around there's going to be another sign that here's the exit from the roundabout to go this way to Northampton. Um, the other thing that, um, and, and Coke is willing to pay for it, is to put a sign further up on uh, before the exit to give drivers an additional prompt. You know, these are, these are people who've been driving for hours and hours and hours. They need a few prompts um, to get them going in the right direction. Um, Next bullet, explore traffic adjustments that would make the neighborhood route to industrial drive less optimal for, navigate, for the navigation apps. This is really interesting because we've already done this and we didn't know it. Um, so we, um, years ago we put in those truck route restrictions for many of the side streets off of, of Bridge Street. And we have the signs with the fines and people are saying, why doesn't the NPD get out there and, you know, ticket those trucks and, you know, it's not worth sending anybody else, people out there for one or two trucks a day. And um, so um, the, so what I did was Best Buy has this great deal, whereas if you buy something, you have two weeks to use it. For, and then you can return it and get your full refund. So I went and bought a, um, a, a, a commercial truck navigation system and because I wanted to see what was on those, uh, what the truckers were looking at. Right about the same time, Ben Heckshire of Valley Trains, he's been in here a few times, he, he's a big proponent of trains. He had gone on, he was looking at his map his maps for the trucking routes, and he noticed that our bridges in those streets, although they're in ordinance, were not uploaded into the system. In other words, that when these guys, you see it in this report, they were following their navigation app, and it didn't direct them away from the bridge because it wasn't in the apps. So he actually went in and manually put them in, and so there's two things linked there. One is my report, the, the other is what Ben actually put into the map, that the heights of the bridges weren't in there, and that the, <laughs> the side streets weren't in there. Suddenly they're in there, and so I got this um, uh, navigation system popped into my car, and didn't, different, they're different from this is live streaming, so when I'm using this for navigation, it's directly going to Google or whoever. When you're using a navigation system, you upload it, and, um, and so it needs to be refreshed every so often. So I took it out of the box, started driving around, and I noticed it was sending me to the bridges because it, the newer stuff that Ben had loaded up wasn't in there yet. So I updated it, Sure enough, there they were. You know that is you drive down Lincoln and say you know no trucks allowed and pop up on the screen and it was starting to direct the drivers 
it, it would direct drivers to Damon Road as they're coming off of exit 19 rather than sending them through the neighborhood. Um, so what this is all to say is that we're, I, in my analysis, we're going to continue to see complaints about trucks. And, but it's going to start to incrementally get better. As, they start, as these drivers start to upload their navigation system, they refresh them, that, um, the, that the new information will get in there and it'll direct them to Damon Road. And then, it, even more so, once that, um, that rotary goes in with the proper signage, that that will, we're starting, we, rather than just one quick message as you're slowing down your, you know, your 18-wheeler, you're actually going to have multiple messages to take Damon Road, rather than um, turn left into Ward 3. The last thing is um, that, and it's kind of related to this third bullet, is that I think there's a few more things we can do in terms of truck restrictions. The thing I noticed with my, before I returned it, was that if I went down, drove my truck down to the bridge by the roost, it was directing me to turn right down Market Street. And we don't want trucks going down. So there's further restrictions, like if we, because we don't have them because it probably seems so obvious that a truck wouldn't want to go there. But like on Union Street, Parson Street, throw some more truck restrictions in there and have it clear so that trucks know that they're supposed to go left and use Phillips Place as the escape route. So, um, so some more tweaking. I'm willing to go out and look into that and then report back to you guys and with some of those suggestions. But I think um, what we'll see is some improvement. And, and also the last thing is Brian continues to work on getting information out to his carriers uh, at, at Coca-Cola. So that's my report. Well, I'd like to thank you for the obviously considerable time to spend on this. My constituents have been after me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could sell this to somebody in Hollywood. It would be an episode on that. Was it that exciting, oh, my report? Thank well, you, I Gary. It's almost a series. You <laughs> 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 just said it. As long as you kept the original packaging to be able to. Oh, them. that's right. There may be a copyright thing in here or something. So, um, and, and you know, and the thing is, we've had complaints of trucks and people using apps to go through neighborhoods in different parts of town, and this may be a way to address some of that, but um, anyway, that's my report. Yeah, I think when the, um, when the Damon Road project, you know, starts to come together a little more fully, it will become apparent that the new signage is working or not, but unfortunately there's you know, a time lag that's going to be associated with Construction does affect the navigation and stuff, so. There was also an issue that was definitely brought up when Devin mentioned before with tool design looking at downtown. That was part of the corridor and definitely one of the issues that came up, so I know there'll be some uh, hopes for signage that's uh, right on the bridge uh, to help people better understand the fact that they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it, the inter all of the carriers that I spoke with, they were, with the, when I told them about all of the signage that we have, they were just like, oh my God, that's terrible. That driver's terrible. <laughs> because we have the diamonds at the bridge. We have the war warning lights like up around historic Northampton. We have, you know, as you're getting off the highway, there's the blinking lights saying don't turn left. I think there's a few, there's another sign somewhere in between there saying this is, bad things are ahead. And um, that, yeah, so the carriers were not at all supportive of their drivers. They were not happy. So. <laughs> I think it's challenging. We have a really busy, both corridors going into it, particularly Main Street, but they're very busy. And if you're not from the area, you're driving a giant truck, there's a lot of pedestrians stepping out. So they're not, their eyes are not looking way to the sides right. where some of those signs and the flashing yellow lights are. So. It's an interesting town. There's a lot to look at. A lot at. to look at. Yeah, yeah. One of the just when you're leaving Coke, are all the drivers told to turn right? That the uh, one of the things they said they would do to with planning board is they're going to work on putting a median outside the the, uh, the plant to 
further direct trucks to head towards the, you know, the, the big road. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, they change their driveway so you, you really can't turn left. I mean, it's already angled. They already have a big rock, so if you're coming in from the south, you can't just take a right turn. You have to go up around their circle. Yeah. So I don't know that it's physically possible to take a 53-foot trailer and turn left out of their driveway, the way the, they, the, way the yeah. geometry of that yeah. is set up. They would have to actually go to the circle and industrial drive, spin around, and then go back through the residential neighborhood. The ruts are there. The rock gets moved. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, thank you. It's an old problem. Yeah. We've had it here before. Yeah, I've called the mass planners. I've, I've lied about the height of the bridge. I've talked to NAFSAR myself. <laughs> you know, so thank you. Any further discussion on this? Okay. Thank you again, Councilor. Thank you. Is there any new business? Sorry, did you have something? No, I was going to move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my next. I'll say I have a motion to adjourn, please. I'll second that. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm going to vote. 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 Hold on. Wait, wait. We need to vote to adjourn. Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. All in favor of adjourning. Aye. Aye.